This is Andy from That UFO Podcast. You're listening to Indie Podcaster, where Jeff features content creators and the great things they're doing. Stick around. Have you been searching for a podcast? Do you want to learn from some great content creators? Well, you've come to the right place. Indie Podcaster, with your host, Jeff Townsend, the Indie Podcast Father. Welcome to a new episode of Indie Podcaster. This is the podcast where we highlight amazing things, amazing content creators are doing. Of course, I'm your host, Jeff Townsend, a.k.a. the Indie Podcast Father, standing tall and proud for our Indie Podcast community. Someone's got to do it. We all got to do it together. Well, this episode, I'm, I'm so freaking thrilled to just share this conversation with you because when I say this is my favorite podcaster, I'm not over-exaggerating. Conrad Thompson is literally one of my favorite podcasters of all time. I think it's amazing the community he's built around all of his different pro wrestling podcast-based theme th- that he does. It's, it's really incredible stuff. And he has a great strategic business approach to the things he does, but yet has a fun-loving spirit while doing it. You can tell that he's a very caring person. And we talk about a lot of great things in this conversation. We talk a little bit about his backstory and how he got into podcasting. And then we talk about some of the things I just mentioned, how he relates it to business and sales and just great information that you need to hear if you're a content creator or if you're just interested in learning more about Conrad Thompson. Like I said, I really do enjoy the content he creates and just the fact that he's a great person makes me that more excited to share this conversation with you. I don't want to waste too much time. We'll get to that. But I do need to talk about the amazing things we're doing on Twitter. We're having a weekly Twitter space every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern podcasting power hour. It's been going really well. We've been hitting right over that 200 people mark. If you're interested in coming by and talking podcasting or you need help with some content creation, I've had my friends from the industry and then other great content creators there, people that are much smarter than me sharing ideas and giving advice. It's been incredible. So yeah, that's Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern. Find me on Twitter at podcast underscore father. That's also a great way to contact me. But if you don't have Twitter, you can also reach me at thepodcastfather at gmail.com. With all that being said, I'm absolutely thrilled to share this stupendous conversation I had with Conrad Thompson. But before we get into that, I got to thank a couple supporters that make this podcast possible. These are great supporters of Indie Podcaster, and they make doing this podcast possible. They're great. Podden.io. Everybody should know that transcription for your podcast is not only fair, it can actually be used to make your podcast more discoverable. If you're not doing it, you need to consider using Podden. If you are currently transcribing, you still need to consider switching to Podden. They're the most accurate and easy service that I have used for this. And I truly mean that. You got to give it a shot. Use the code IndiePodcaster to receive 50% off your first month. Having a website for your podcast is absolutely critical. I understand how intimidating and challenging this seems, creating your website, because it it really can be. But honestly, it doesn't need to be. PodPage makes this process super easy. You can create a beautiful podcast website in five minutes. Five freaking minutes. It is that simple with PodPage. Let the team show you how easy this process can be. Use the code IndiePodcaster to receive $20 off any pro plan. Everyone knows how much I love being an indie podcaster, but as you know, everyone listening, I'm sure, it is hard to balance life, work, and being a content creator. It's a huge challenge that we all face, but I have found one way to make sure I have more time to focus on my content creating. I now have a podcast editor. I hired the great team at How's It Podcasting. The team at How's It Podcasting has done great work with it. They're reliable and extremely affordable. It gives me more time to focus on what is most important, creating the content. Find How's It Podcast Editing on any of their social media pages. That's How's It Podcast Editing. H-O-W-Z-I-T Podcast Editing. They're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Make sure you hit them up. All right, let's get to this awesome conversation, which happens to be powered by Boomcaster, which you'll hear more about later in this episode. Conrad, man, I am so excited to talk to you. We've gone back and forwards for over a year now, so... Chris Van Vliet told me a few months ago, as you know, chatting with him, he said, hey, don't give up on him. He's just the busiest man in the world. So he will do it one day. And here we stand. Well, not we, we sit, but you know what I mean, Conrad. You've made it happen, man. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I know we had a little technical snafu this morning, but Hey man, we got it done where there's a will, there's a way. And we had a lot of will on both sides. Yeah. You had, I thought you had a grumpy face on there for a minute. I was like, Oh shit. I've already ruined it, man. Damn. Oh no, no, not at all. I just, you know, technology challenges like, Hey man, this one doesn't work, but that one does. And this one does. And Hey man, we found it. We made it work. We're here. We did it. So like I was telling you beforehand, man, like obviously a lot of the audience are other podcasters, content creators, and you really are. When I say like, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I talk to a lot of podcasters. You're my favorite man. So for you to take the time to do this is incredible. And we're just kind of deep dive into a little bit about you and then how you got into content creation, man. So I I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Glad to be here. Glad to have some time with you and looking forward to having some fun this morning. Absolutely. So you're into all sorts of things now, but going back to the beginning, you weren't a podcaster necessarily. So you actually have a business outside of that, that you're still involved in. We get to that questions I have about that later. But so talk to us about that a little bit. The mortgage, is it called the mortgage industry or do I just sound like a fool saying that? No, no, that's right. Yeah. I I joined uh, the mortgage industry, August 27th, 2001. So I'm about to be 21 years old in the game and it changed my life. It's been the best decision I ever made. And slowly but surely was able to grow my business from just being a quote unquote loan officer. And these days they call them a mortgage loan originator or an MLO and uh, eventually became a branch manager and then was lucky enough to be in a position to open a few branches and sort of go out on my own and start my own thing. And I had a lot of fun, man. And it's just one of those things where you get to a point where you say, okay, I've done as much word of mouth as I can. I need to do some advertising. So I started advertising my mortgage company on the TV and and radio and radio evolved into me doing live spots. So even this morning, before I talked to you, I did a handful of live commercials on, on radio stations and I would call in, talk to the hosts about whatever they want to talk about and find some sort of slick way to transition into talking about mortgages and move on to the next station. So eventually I met Rick Flair and he and I hit it off and he had an opportunity to do a podcast, but he said, what's a podcast? How does that work? Can you make any money on a podcast? And Where'd you meet him at Conrad? So yeah, I met him with, there was a convention in Rome, Georgia. And I had uh, made the acquaintance of uh, a few different folks in wrestling, Mr. Jim Cornette and J.J. Dillon and Jake the Snake. And I'd met a few guys over the years. But anyway, I had a mutual friend who introduced me to Rick. And he had just recently lost his son. And we just hit it off. And I found out he was living just outside of Atlanta, which is not too terribly far from me. And one day he invited me to come over and watch some sports on, on a weeknight and hang out. And I did. Eventually, I found myself invited to his birthday party, which was super fun and kind of random, but we just hit it off. And so eventually, we just started hanging. And what do you know? Eventually, he was back on WWE TV, invited me to tag along and see how the sausage was made. And on one of those trips, I think it was in Nashville, he had done this waiting for wishes thing. And we're at the uh, Hilton downtown right next to the Palm, uh, where he had done this waiting for wishes, where some group had a celebrity waiter the night before named Ric Flair. And he said, Hey man, uh, how do you make money on a podcast? What is that about? Show me on my phone. And he hands me his phone and I show him and he's like, Oh, okay. So what do you think? Should I do one? And so, you know, he showed me what his agent had sent over and the whole thing. And he was excited about it. So the next thing I hear is he calls and he says, Hey, do you want to come in and just ask me fan questions in the first episode? And I said, yeah, man, that'd be awesome. And he goes, I'm just not comfortable just talking into a microphone by myself. I need to bounce off of somebody. I just feel like I would be more comfortable with that. And I said, sure, man, I'd, I'd be glad to. So I hopped a little quick Delta flight to Atlanta. It's 19 minutes over and zip downtown to CBS studios and walked in. And I don't think he told CBS, Hey, I'm bringing a guy in. And they're like, uh, who is this? And why is he here? But <laughs> I had never done this before, but I had done radio, you know, some of my radio mm-hmm. buddies that I'd been tight with, they would say, Hey man, uh, do you want to come in and do a shift for me. I'm, I'm on vacation and listeners like you, why don't you just come in and do guest host? So I said, ah, cool. So I did it on some sports stations, some political talk stations, some rock stations, stuff like that. So I was all game to do it, but I knew I needed to be prepared. So I brought in like seven pages of notes that was bold and highlighted and in larger font. So he could easily see it and it would be easily accessible and all that. And CBS was like, I don't know who you are, but thanks for all this. And Then we started doing it. And at the end of the episode, they said, Hey, can you come in next week? And I became an accidental podcaster. It wasn't the plan. I just knew, Hey, I didn't want to half-ass it. I wanted to have a good effort here for Rick. And 
it worked out. So yeah, I became an accidental podcaster and here we are. That's awesome. And I think it's important to note for the people listening that for you or somebody like myself to meet Ric Flair is a big deal because of how big of fans we were of uh, wrestling growing up. So to you, I'm sure it was like, you were just nervous as hell, you know, just excited as hell. Like, what am I going to do? So obviously you had some podcasts experience as far as listener what were some of the stuff that you were consuming before you got into being a podcaster jim Cornette or oh yeah i listened to jim Cornette and i listened to stone cold steve austin chris jericho jim ross i listen to all those for sure so you, it's kind of like a dream come true to you to sit here and record with rick flair so it becomes a regular thing which is incredible for you i'm sure so this is funny because now you have a build a whole empire you're the pod father of the wrestling podcast industry, hands down. But going back then, if we go back to Woo Nation, because I, I love that, you were not the same Conrad Thompson as far as a podcaster personality that you are today. And I'll give you an example. I remember listening to several episodes, right? Like, we'll get to Bruce Pritchard, but that episode, Rick is shooting the shit, having a great time. And you're just chiming in every once in a while, trying to ask legitimate questions that listeners would want to hear. You weren't you could just tell you weren't as comfortable in the situation as you are with with the guys that you're working with today so i mean you've grown over time so talk to us about when you first started how the struggles of that i mean because you're like i said you've evolved greatly man well i appreciate you saying that you know i I don't have any sort of formal training i didn't go to school for this I, i didn't go to some sort of broadcasting classes or i don't have no degrees in this nothing it was just a matter of Hey, what would I want to listen to and me trying real hard? And, you know, I listened to Howard Stern and I listened to a lot of local radio and, and I understood, you know, a little bit of the dynamic of what the guy who's driving does. And then the other guy. So there's mm-hmm. like point counterpoint, but almost if you were, let's say you're, you're watching professional wrestling, which is the topic of most of my shows, you have a play by play guy, and then you have a color commentator. And I understood that it's the job of the play by play guy to, get us in and out of breaks, do the ad reads, Mm -hmm. do the heavy lifting, so to speak. He's the point guard to use a basketball analogy. And I understood very early on that my job here is to just get the ball where it needs to be for those guys to score. So they're the Jordan. I'm the Pippen. They're the Malone. I'm the Stockton sort of deal. And I was always comfortable with that. But I think one of the things that that changed is when we went from just having the quote unquote, Ric Flair show where it's not really a personality driven show based on two people, people who are listening to the Ric Flair show want to hear Ric Flair. They don't really want to hear anybody else. They want to hear Ric Flair talk about Ric Flair and his stories and his life. And I think some other podcasts sort of miss it. Like for instance, I love Chris Jericho's podcast, but I think Chris probably his audience is best served when Chris is talking about Chris. Like I'm sure that Chris Jericho listeners are interested in him hearing a conversation with say a William Regal, because that's great stuff. But at the same time, if you're doing a guest driven format, now you've got this pressure every week of, I've got to have a better guest than I did last week. And that's really hard to do 50 times, 52 times a year. I know because we did it on the first versions of Ric Flair show. And so we would have like Shawn Michaels and it would crush. But then the next week we would do a continuation and do Shawn Michaels part two and the downloads would be down. Nobody wanted a part two. Well, I learned that the hard way. I also learned that it doesn't matter how big the guest is, if it's not in your wheelhouse for the audience, they don't Mm -hmm. care if it doesn't relate. You're right. They just don't care. So I had Dana white, you know, that one of the owners of the UFC, I mean, a big get, it didn't do great download wise. I had Lawrence Taylor. It didn't do great download wise. I had Darius Rucker. It didn't do great download wise. Then I have nasty boy knobs and it crushes. And that just didn't make any sense. I mean, if I walked into my local Walmart with nasty boy knobs, I don't know that we would be bothered. Let me strut around in there with Dana White and boy, it's going to turn into a meet and greet. But in terms of super serving our audience, that wasn't it. Our wrestling fans who listened to the Ric Flair show wanted to hear Ric Flair talk about Ric Flair. Now, fast forward to the Bruce Pritchard show. And I said, Hey man, we should do a show based on what fans think happened based on what they read online or they read a newsletter versus quote unquote, what really happened from someone who was there. And I know that he, I knew that he was going to dig his heels in and be argumentative for the sake of being argumentative at times and take a, a hard company defense stance at certain times. And I totally get that. 
However, I do think that there was always going to be an opportunity for us to let the audience kind of decide what they believe. So you get two versions of the story out there, what Dave Meltzer wrote, what Bruce Pritchard said. And then the truth is probably somewhere in the middle because Dave wasn't there and Bruce was, but Bruce wasn't privy to everything. And even if he was, he's probably not able to share everything. So the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And I think that's, what's made our show so fun. Most of you listening to this are aware that I have a different conversation that I share every single episode. Well, I've discovered an amazing tool that's helping me do that in the best quality, simplistic, great way possible. Boomcaster. I've recently made this big change and I was a little nervous at first, but I'm so glad that I did because it's been an amazing experience. If you don't know what Boomcaster is, you really got to look into this because if you are frequently recording conversations on some platform like Zoom, it's just not designed for that. And I'll explain. Boomcaster is actually designed for content creators, podcasters. You can schedule, stream, and record all from one platform. They are just dedicated to indie podcasters and independent content creators. They deliver studio quality audio and video every time, all the time. You can record and live stream to reach the biggest audience possible. Let me explain why you got to get caught up with the times here. Traditional conferencing solutions rely on network speed for each participant. That is not the case with Boomcaster. It saves locally and uploads to the cloud, giving you the freedom to record from anywhere. And that's significant as far as the audio delay and all those things that you experience when you're creating content and recording. Like I said, I know the people at Boomcaster personally, and I vouch for them. They support us indie podcasters. We need to support the independent creators like them. It's time to upgrade to Boom. And you know what? If you use the code IndiePodcaster at checkout, you'll get your 30 days free plus 50% off your first three months. That's incredible. If you want to legitimize the content you are creating, you've got to use Boomcaster. And I always think about our shows in terms of like local sports talk radio. So I grew up here in Alabama and our sports talk radio, as you can imagine, for the last well, more than 10 years, has been about the run that the Alabama Crimson Tide have been on in college football. Well, imagine this as talk radio. Boy, I just don't see anybody who can beat Alabama this year. And the co-host goes, me either. And the first guy goes, we'll be back after these words. (laughs) That's not entertaining. There's no substance to that. The second guy, the guy who's not driving the ship, but the other guy has to be the antagonist. And he has to say, I don't know, man, Ole Miss has beat them twice and nobody saw that coming. I still think they've got problems in the secondary, the quarterback. Maybe he's got a case of the big head. Maybe he came in late last year and had some success, but can he do it across the whole season? That remains to be seen. Okay. Now we've got a discussion and people can call in and create a debate. And so it's just understanding the medium, I guess. And I understood, Hey man, I got to have point counterpoint. If Bruce and I agree about everything, if Eric and I agree about everything, I don't really know where we go from there. And so the conflicts that we don't manufacture that we legitimately feel differently on are what really resonated with the crowd and with the audience and with the listener base. But we know that if it's fake, they'll know. So we're not going to fake it. It'll be something that I really believe and something that he really believes, but it's not to the point where when we hang up, we're not friends anymore. Like, we're putting on a show and we're okay to disagree. You know, whether you're conservative or you're liberal, you probably have friends who are the opposite way of you because they're your friend and your political beliefs shouldn't always necessarily dictate who you're friends with. Well, certainly the same is true of wrestling. Like I don't want friends who just sleep under a WWE blanket or an AEW blanket, but I'm okay if they do, but I'm not going to pick one. I like wrestling. I'll watch them both sort of deal. Yeah. And I think, man, that you come from a business mindset beforehand that that probably definitely helped. So you get connected with because I remember that episode with Rick and you guys brought on Bruce. So is that like the beginning of you being introduced to Bruce? Yeah. So the first time I ever talked to Bruce was on Rick's show. And man, that was 2015, I believe. Yeah. So the first time we spoke was 2015. And then towards late 2015, I had the opportunity to work with Bruce. I was doing some recruiting and on my mortgage business, and I knew that he knew production. And so in a casual conversation with Rick, he said, what about Bruce? So I started talking to Bruce about, hey, man, here's the idea. Could you help me put together this shoot and you know, just make it better? Absolutely. And we did gangbuster business with it. It was a success. And I wound up hiring Bruce in a full-time position to help me 
build a bunch of landing pages and a bunch of different campaign stuff that I'm still using all these years later. And through the course of that, at the end of one really long shooting day, we're just crashing out on my couch in my living room here in Huntsville. And I look over and I said, Hey man, what happened when, and I talked about the radicals jumping from WCW to the WWF. And he turned in his chair a little bit and he told me a story for the better part of an hour with me chiming in and asking follow-up questions and things like that. And at the end I said, dude, this is a podcast. And he had the same attitude that a lot of people did. And he said, oh, I've done a podcast before. There's no money in podcasting. Nobody wants to hear my stories. It's just a hassle. No, thanks. And I'm like, no, I'm not saying do the podcast the way you did the podcast. He's like, well, it's just a hard, it's a hassle to get guests. And you know, that we're doing that show with Rick. I said, no, no, what we just did, if we were to have recorded it, every wrestling fan in the world would have been fascinated and wanted to hear it. We just, we messed up by not recording it. We should start recording these conversations and just air them. So I wore him down over the course of the next two weeks. He agreed to at least just record something with me here in this same room. And we did. And we talked to court Bauer from MLW and he agreed to help us get up and going. And we did. And man, here we are. It worked out. I can't say that either one of us would have predicted it worked out as well as it did, but it did. Yeah. And I think the big thing was you had formed that and you could tell before in the beginning of the podcast, a really good relationship with Bruce, like you just said, over various things over the time period. And the timing was great, right? Because podcast is really starting to take off. They were now implemented on the phones, like the apps and it was different from what Bruce had tried before. So your determination to keep him on that was big because the timing also, along with you guys, was incredible time to start doing it. And there was a need for something like that out there because like you said, Stone Cold was probably, and JR were, were the closest to, and there's a lot of other, you know, they weren't kind of sharing that side of it that Bruce has. So you always say the comment, it's like a nostalgia thing with your podcast. Absolutely. And we get to hear from the guy behind the scenes on the leadership team and that organization. That was huge, let alone the personalities, but there was such a need for it. And you guys were able to dig into that and just find it and serve it. And it's funny when you go back and listen, because I talk to a lot of different people, right? A lot of different podcasters are like quality is absolutely everything. You go back and you listen to those episodes with you and Bruce, or you guys did like a rerun recently, recently on ad free shows that like him talking about Vince McMahon, you guys you put something together, but your guys podcasting journey, you can see it grow throughout that because in the beginning, it didn't sound like the stuff that you're recording now, man. Right. No, it, it's way different and it's an evolution. And that's always been a big piece of my advice to folks who were wanting to figure out how to get into this. And I would always say, Hey man, you just got to start doing stuff. I know that sounds really simplistic, but if you're waiting until Zig Ziglar used to have a line where he said, if we waited until all the lights were green, we'd never go to town. Well, that's the idea is you're going to have stops and starts. You're going to have stumbles. You're going to have growing pains, but it's just part of it. You, you won't know what those are until you do it. So, you know, Gary V sometimes will say, Hey, ideas are shit. The money's in execution. Well, that's a little crass, but the reality is just start doing stuff and you'll figure out what works and do more of that. And you'll figure out what doesn't work and you'll do less of that. You go back and you listen to some of those early something to wrestles. And we were very much talking about, Hey, what's going on with the most recent shows and what did you think of it? And then we would talk about the feedback from last week's show. And then we would get into this week's topic. And eventually we said, nobody cares about the current stuff and it doesn't age well and it's polarizing. Let's just talk about the nostalgia and that nostalgia format. We realized, wow, we're onto something. And so all these years later, man, I'm just wallered in, in nostalgia. I've got more nostalgia podcasts than I know what to do with. That was an important decision that you guys made. And I'll kind of get into that. So that decision right there. And then you've kind of segued off of that. You brought in people, Eric, Tony Schiavone, you continue to evolve and grow. And then you get somebody like Arn Anderson. I, I love Arn Anderson. I love that podcast. You are really good about realizing when to pivot. And I'll give an example. You just gave one. I'll give another. You have changed up the format of art show. So you had Ask Arn, right? That was huge. But it seemed almost as if it reached a point in time where you guys realized we got to change up the format of this show, what we're doing a little bit. You were doing it every two weeks, that segment. You made some pretty big changes. So talk to us about why you did that and how important it was to be able to know 
and what some of the indicating factors were to know when to make that change? Because it was a significant one. Arn is the first wrestler I did a podcast with, and I realized very quickly on that this was not going to be like all my other shows where the guys could really talk about anything and everything that was happening because they were quote unquote office or commentators or what have you. So they saw everything that was happening in front of the camera, behind the scenes, all that. Whereas from a wrestler perspective, he could talk about what he was personally involved in. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to wear two hats and I tried to talk about a little bit of his history but I really wanted to spend a lot of time talking about the behind the scenes agenting of WWE because he would have been involved in with the entire roster and producing different matches. And, and I felt like that format was a lot of fun, but I knew that we couldn't realistically do that every single week and just talk about, cause people who were going to listen to an Arn Anderson podcast, they want to hear Arn Anderson stuff. So I was trying to serve two masters. And I felt like doing an ask Arn would give people an opportunity to really learn about who he is. Because he wrote a book that was largely written in character. It wasn't really a tell all expose of the business or the industry or what have you. And he never really did a bunch of shoot interviews. I mean, he was very close to the vest. He he was not big on revealing the secrets or the magic of professional wrestling. And I understood that, but obviously now if you're going to do a podcast, that's got to be a little different. So let's tell people who you really are and what you really like and what you're really about and not the character Arn Anderson, but the real Marty Lundy. And I think people got a chance to see that, but it did reach a point where, you know, okay, we've kind of set the tone. Now we've set the pace for that. Let's go episodically and let's tell your story in wrestling. And we're doing that month by month. And every week we break down another month and we're covering his entire journey. And we're through 1989 and and we'll go through 1997. And then we'll probably start, you know, pivoting a little bit and talking more about the agenting and the life he's had outside of wrestling, uh, as far as inside the squared circle. So he was still actively involved in wrestling, but in a backstage capacity. And I think we need to just talk through all of that a lot more. So yeah, I think shifting the model and listening to your audience and just knowing when it's time. And I've always been a realist about, is this good content? Is this something I would listen to? And I try to position myself as the first listener. And as long as I've got that, I think we'll be okay. And that's been the approach. Yeah, it was great because it definitely had played its course as great as it was. I mean, love talking about the food that he would eat. And <laughs> it was a really good opportunity to get to know him more because like you said, it's just, he's kind of a reserved fella in comparison to some of the personalities that you talk to. So it was a great introduction to get the podcast going, but you couldn't do that forever. So the segue and that pivot to what you're doing now was It was critical and incredible. So before we kick things off, we only have to do it the right way. Let's just get the uh, the sponsor of this episode (laughs) going here. Tell us about yourself, Greg. Tell us what you offer, pal. Yeah. So if you're a true crime, paranormal, scary, or comedy podcaster, and you're looking to grow your show, you can submit an episode to Indie Drop-In. We will play the full episode of your show to an embedded base of listeners, listeners looking for your content. Then if they like you, They'll follow you. And guess what? It's 100% free. I actually pay Tanner and Jeff to get your content. If you can believe that. I don't know how I got roped into being the creator of Indie Drop-In, but I will like to promote your show. How was that, Jeff? That's good. Tanner, what do you think? I think you did a better job than I do. <laughs> Definitely does a better job than I do. I can hardly even talk. Yeah. Well, no, I think you do a great job. I, uh, I've i heard your ads so many times that now I just replay them in my head. But for anyone interested in submitting a show, just go to IndieDropIn.com forward slash creators. Just follow the form and I'll take it from there. I think one of the great things about you, Conrad, is you work with so many people now on these podcasts and being a content creator, I actually, I'm listening to what you're doing, the way you're doing things. I'm paying attention to those things and you don't quite condone yourself the same with each and every one of them. There's different, you have a different relationship. You speak differently with them. You're still Conrad Thompson, but talk about how you're able to just, you can't talk to Arn Anderson like you do Bruce Pritchard because you don't have that relationship. You're able to really do well with different kinds of, personalities because they're all different man man they really are well i mean that comes from being a salesperson if i'm honest with you you know i've been in sales my entire life my dad's a salesman my grandfather was a salesman my my aunts and uncles were salespeople so you know part of being a salesperson is you've got to know who your audience is and you've got to you got to be a chameleon for them you know 
the sales process is not about me selling what I want to sell. The sales process is about me helping you find what you want to buy. And when you understand that it's not about me, it's about you, uh, sales gets a little easier. And I think the same thing is true of hosting a podcast, you know, on some level as a podcast host, and you may not recognize this yet, you're a salesperson. You're going to be selling an audience on why to listen to you. You're going to be selling guests on why to come on. You're going to be hopefully selling advertisers on why they need to advertise with you. And then ultimately you're going to be selling their product. There's a whole lot of selling involved in podcasting and the folks who say, well, I don't want to sell. That's another way of saying, I don't want to be successful to me. And so when you really understand and wrap your head around, this is all sales on some level, then everything gets a little easier. And so we've got to figure out a way to make it easy and comfortable for the listener to want to tune in every week. I mean, getting them to try you just one time is a tall order, but it's even harder to make yourself a regular part of their routine. So you've got to think about not necessarily what do I want to talk about? Because frankly, no one cares. You've got to instead say, what do they want to hear about? And what they want to hear about is probably if if you're entrenched in the fandom, like I am, what you want to hear. So when I'm asking questions on the show, I'm trying to ask what I think fans want to hear, but I'm also trying to ask in a way that makes them want to answer. I don't want to be too confrontational. I don't want to be too adversarial. You get the idea. Oh, absolutely. And I think, like I said, you can't deal with Arn the same way you were with Bruce, but you're still able to bring out that lighter side and get the great stories and information from them. But you have to approach it different in every situation because they're different people. So you're right. A salesman sees that. Like, let's say you're selling cars to come onto the lot. You have to, in a short amount of time, be able to read that kind of person you're selling to and almost stay true to yourself, but transform the delivery and the personality of that to have a business transaction. So you're right. You really are a salesman when you're doing this. To be clear, I think there's a great cliche about wrestling and even about just sales and life in general. Telling ain't selling. And so, you know, to use your car salesman analogy, let's say you and the wife pull up on my car lot and I run out and I say, oh man, I'm so glad you guys are here. Thank you for coming in today. Let me tell you, we've got, you know, the ultimate award-winning convertible here. This thing is fast. It's so fun. It's so sporty. It just won all these awards. You got to see the way this thing handles, blah, blah, blah. Everything on the lot is a piece of crap compared to this one. This is just head and shoulders above all the competitors, the best bang for the buck, the most horsepower, the best resale, blah, 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 blah. And then at the end, I say, what do you think? And then you go, well, my wife's van broke down. We're here to look for a van. I've spent all this time selling you on a convertible because that's what I wanted to sell you. Maybe because I was excited about it or it paid me more commission. I never asked, Hey man, what brings you guys in today? (laughs) If I just would have started with that right up front, you would have said, well, my wife's van just blew up. So we're here to look for something else. Are you looking to thinking about another van or an SUV or what are we thinking? Well, we probably want a van. What are we looking for? What are the must have options? Do we need a big engine? Do we need TVs in the back for the kids or no, we just need one that's safe and affordable. Okay. What colors do you like? That's selling my friend. I'm not making it about what I want to sell. I'm asking and I go from very generic to very specific. And at the end, I'll know, okay, what they want is a blue minivan for $300 a month that has a great warranty. Well, if that's the way it wound up, I never have to bother showing them the new Mustang. I can show them these two blue minivans with great warranties. Hey, this one's 300 a month. This one's 400 a month. We'll take the 300. Thank you. On to the next that's selling. He got exactly what he wanted, but I didn't have to sell him on it. I just asked questions. So telling ain't selling is a big part of your conversation on your podcast and a big part of your ad delivery just in life. Telling ain't selling. You got to ask questions. Yeah. Just to paint you a picture, Conrad, if I pulled up, there would be my wife and I, three kids screaming in the back seat. I would be stepping out with McDonald's French fries flying out the doors because all the kids and then that's how it would start for me. So I get it. You know how it is. (laughs) But anyway, man, you're right. And by going through that, process you just talked about you saved a lot of time too i mean wasted time that just honestly becomes degrading and makes you hard to even do business with somebody so it is absolutely critical and another thing that's critical 
for you especially, as you expanded this so much and built what you have, you had to rely on a team. You had to rely on a team back dealing with the mortgage company that you have. You've had to rely on a team to build this ad for everything that you're doing now. So talk to us about your workload in the beginning. And then when you kept growing, you had to really rely on a great team, how important that is. Well, I believe in growing when you need to. And I know that sounds silly, but like I've never raised money for a business. I've always just bootstrapped it. I've ran off a P&L. I'm not going to, all right, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to quit my job and go build out a, I'm going to raise some money and build out a podcasting studio and blah, blah, blah. No, we're not going to do it with that. We're going to do it with what we can afford and what we know and grow as we grow. And I've never been in a situation where, you know, I lived beyond my means in my business life, if that makes sense. Like when I made the decision to move from one location to another, it was because I had people sitting on top of people that we were bursting at the seams. We couldn't, it wasn't sustainable. We're out of parking spots. That's when you move. That's when you grow. Well, I did the same thing here. So at first, absolutely. I picked all the topics. I did all the research. I learned how to edit. I set all the equipment up as we get more successful and and we start to have more revenue come in. And we start to think about, wow, what if we scaled this thing? I tried to do the same thing with show two and show three. And then eventually I realized there's not enough time in the day for me to do all of this. But what happened is when we created something special and we created something fun, people came out of the woodwork saying, Hey man, I want to do what he's doing. I want to be a part of this. I want to join up. How do I get involved? How can I be a part? And I still get messages like that all the time. And a lot of times I would ask those folks, I actually, I always ask. Hey man, I know you can do anything. I know you would do anything, but what would you really love to do? Like if you close your eyes and you say, man, in a perfect world, I would do blank. What is that? And the reason I asked that Jeff is because if you can help them figure out how to do that, you'll never have to ask them to come in early or stay late or go revise this or work harder on that. If it's what they really love to do, they'll jump at the chance to do it. For instance, I love creating wrestling podcasts. Like I love what I do. You never have to convince me to do it. Now I'm pretty sure my wife is upset that I haven't already taken out the trash today. I don't love to do that. Now I can do it. I will do it, but it's not necessarily what I, man, I can't wait to wake up and take out the trash. That's not my thing. Now I'm going to do it because I don't, I don't want to deal with the ref, but still it's not what I want to do. So I'm saying all that to say Dave Silva approached us and just made some graphics for us and said, Hey man, love your show. I made these graphics for you when you told us what the new topics are. Hope you like them. And I said, dude, these are badass. Can you make these for us every week? And he said, I'd be delighted. And then I started to ask, what do you do in your real life? Oh, I work in a newsroom. Really? Yeah. I'm the assistant news director or whatever it was. And I've been doing it for so-and-so time. And I'm like, oh, so you're familiar with production? He goes, yeah, heck yeah. I was like, could you film our first live show? I'd be delighted. So he filmed our first live show. Then I heard from another guy who said, hey, man. I run a music school. I love tinkering with music. Love your podcast. Can I tinker with the idea of making you guys a new theme song? I was like, yes, please do. That was how I met Matt Coon. He made the very first something to wrestle theme song. And man, we start using it all these years later. It's fantastic. And somebody else came out of the woodwork and said, Hey man, I just want to help grow your Instagram. I see you're working on Twitter, but I noticed that you haven't really spent any time on Instagram. I do that for a living love the show. Can I help with the Instagram? I said, absolutely. Well, that's how I met Evan Polisher. He now runs ad free shows for us. There was another kid who started posting funny graphics for all of our shows. His name was Ryan. And I started to see the stuff and I said, dude, these are great. Do you want to be our new t-shirt guy? And he goes, well, I've ne- I don't know how to do that. Well, you just did. You've been making the graphics. We've just got to show you how to build the store on the back end. But my wife knows how to do that. I put them together. Ryan's our t-shirt guy. So it became one of those deals where literally everyone showed some sort of interest in something, showed off their skill of here's what I'm good at. Here's what I'm passionate at. uh, Here's what I believe I can be a contributor for. And and we signed them up and it's worked out, but it's worked that way with Steve Kaufman and YouTube and Ryan and t-shirts and, and Derek and research Derek Savato, who helps put together a research happens to also help Dave Meltzer do his. Mm. And when he asked Dave one day, Hey man, you got any more work? I'm trying to grow my little side hustle. And he goes, I'm good, but you should call Conrad. Conrad's creating a lot of content and he probably has a a need for a guy like you. And it turns out he's got a big history in independent wrestling. And we were one degree separated for a long time. And 
he showed me some of the, we just tried it. Now he took a stab at it and did a great job and he's our guy now. So the whole thing has just been almost like that Kevin Costner movie. If you build it, they will come. And folks who just really were like-minded and had a passion for this and dug it. Now they're a part of the team. Chris McDonald is another great example. He loved the show, made some fun little silly videos that I thought were fantastic. And I encouraged him to do more. And as soon as I could, I hired him. He's in a full-time position now with us working on all of our videos. And it's been a process, man, a journey, but so much fun. Yeah. And you couldn't have done it without that team too, because as you've grown, those relationships were organic. And without everybody playing and knowing their part, it would have been very hard to do, put it that way. Yeah, it would have been unbelievably difficult to try to do all of this on your own. But the point is, I knew I couldn't do it all on my own. You know, in my mortgage business, I have a customer service team who field phone calls and make outbound calls. And I have, you know, mortgage loan originators who talk to those customers and find the right solution for them. Then I've got loan processors who handle all the paperwork. Then I've got loan underwriters who make sure it meets the guidelines for Fannie and Freddie and FHA, et cetera, et cetera. Then I've got, you know, closers and funders and Mm -hmm. shippers. And so it's not just one guy. And I think a lot of people think even on the mortgage side, well, no, this guy did my mortgage. Well, he's the guy you talk to, Yeah, but there was a dozen other people who helped make that thing happen. Well, and on my podcast, the same thing is true. Well, it's Conrad's podcast. Well, I'm the guy you listen to a dozen other people who helped make it possible. For sure. And that is absolutely critical. You answered part of my Dave Silva question. My second one is, is he really that bad of a driver? Like I always hear. Oh, the worst. Yeah, Just the worst. Yeah. That guy. He, he's a great guy, but man, he, he will tear your shit up. Anyway. Yeah. He's totaled a bunch of cars. He's curbed my wheels more times than I can count. Yeah. It's been a situation. Oh, man. It, we all have a friend like that, though, I think. I think still I love think him, but do. yeah. Jeff Townsend here, and I'm excited to talk to my good friend, Mark Binder. I'm just kidding. His name is Mark Binder. He doesn't like it when I say that. Mark is the (laughs) creator. I'm going to say owner just because it sounds entrepreneur-y of Podtricks, the podcast hosting platform. Thanks for joining us, man. I'm excited to hear about this new Podtricks feed import feature that you're going to share with me and us, everybody, the world. Share it with the world, Mark. World behold this. Uh, no. So yeah, the Podtricks feed importer, it's really simple. The Podtrix feed importer is really exciting because it's how you migrate your existing podcast feed to Podtrix hosting. All you got to do is the, the URL that you would submit to Spotify or Apple or Overcast or whatever, you paste that into the little pop-up that shows up in your show and you say import. The system then goes and will start importing all of your episodes, whether it be 10 episodes or 10,000 episodes. It will pull in every single episode, all the audio, your descriptions, your categories. Everything is moved into Podtrix seamlessly and is ready for publishing. This feature is already live right now and is available to anybody who wants to use it. So what we're really here, this is like the big coming out party for all you current podcasters to come on over and check out Podtrix, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Everybody's welcome. You do offer something to the listeners of this podcast. If you use the code IndiePod during checkout, you'll get 25% off your first three months of Podtrix. That's a good deal. I'm here to support you guys to be creative. You can contact me by sending an email to hello at podtricks.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, I encourage everybody to go on to podtricks.com right now and check it out and use the promo code NDPOD to get a little bit of a discount. We're winding down here, Conrad. So let's segue to that a little bit. Some of my questions are like an example would be, this is my dream interview, man. And I, I appreciate it. Who's somebody that you haven't connected with in the wrestling industry that you would really like to, because you've, it's several, several, you know, (laughs) you're connected now, but is there somebody past, present that you wish you could have spoke with or can speak with in one day? Well, yeah, I mean, as far as wish in a past tense, I think Dusty Rhodes would have one of the best podcasts around. He would just Mm -hmm. be a content creation superstar right now. So would Bobby Heenan. I think it would have been fantastic to have macho man at a star cast or doing a podcast, you know, just the macho cast seems like a fun idea, but as far as, you know, folks I'd like to work with in the future or me, I've kind of met everybody at this point. I mean, from the rock to Vince McMahon to Paul Heyman, I've pretty much met everybody, but Paul Heyman and Michael Hayes are two like white whales out there of podcasting that I think would just be phenomenal. I think Paul Heyman's podcast could 
Oh yeah. Organic. And I think Michael Hayes is a guy a lot like Bruce Pritchard where wrestling fans think they have an idea of who he is because they read something online, but they've never actually got to know him and to hear Michael explain the way his wrestling brain works and tell his stories is to love him. And I think those would be huge successes and a lot of fun, but I don't know that it's very realistic since they both work with WWE and I can't Mm -hmm. imagine that stopping anytime soon. Yeah, no, I agree, but those would be great examples for sure, man. So if you had to just give, I mean, we already talked about just create content. So a lot of people listen to this, like I said, are content creators, wrestling fans, and a lot that listen to your podcast. So if you had to give some advice on somebody who is just getting into this, because it's hard when you just get into it, what other advice would you give besides just create content? The real work happens before you click record. I think a lot of people think that what makes you successful in content creation is what happens once you click record, but the real work happens beforehand. And I think the same is true. You know, you go back and look at like all in when Cody Rhodes wrestled Nick Aldis before those guys ever touched the fans were on their feet going bananas and they both just sort of were able to look left and look right. And it seems like they just got louder and louder and more excited and more into it. And they hadn't even touched yet. And I guess what I'm saying is if you do your job well, then half the battle is done before you ever click record before you, before the match ever started, the hay was kind of in the barn for that one. People were already excited to see it. And if you can create hype and anticipation and expectation, et cetera, et cetera, man, this is just going to be a whole heck of a lot easier. There's more to it than just, all right, well, here's what we're going to talk about. So we have fun graphics for every episode. We ask for fan questions for every episode. We post little clips about every topic for every episode all over social and because socials are free way to market. I mean, social media is the way we've grown all of this. Like my Starcast convention at the end of July, we spent $200 marketing it and we've sold hundreds of thousands of dollars in pre-sales and it's because it was well done. But that's my point is we didn't have to have some big marketing budget to do it. We just, we know that you got to build the hype. You got to build the anticipation. You got to help sell it. You got to give them what they want. And for my stance on the podcast side, man, it's all about the preparation. So like, if I'm going to sit down and record with Bruce tomorrow, and I think we are at 10 30 Eastern, I've already looked, I have 17 pages of notes Mm -hmm. and I've got clips and I'm rewatching stuff and I'm going to be ready to discuss this topic thoroughly and have a great conversation. And if he's ready and able to do the same, it'll be a successful show. But if I'm just sort of phoning it in and I think I'm here to just create content for the sake of creating it, it's it's not going to work. And I think that is the difference between radio and podcasting. I feel like in a lot of radio guys get into podcasting and it's not, it's not as easy as they may have originally thought because they had all this great success in radio. Why don't I have that same success in podcasting? I feel like a lot of people, let's say if you're a radio listener, you buy a car One of the first things you do within the first 30 days of ownership, if you're me within the first hour of ownership is you program your buttons Mm -hmm. and they call those buttons, something in radio that's P one, P two, P three. So that's preset one, preset two, preset three. And the idea being, these are going to be your favorite stations you listen to all the time. So you don't have to spin around the dial and find something just here's my favorite station. Oh, they're on a commercial. Well, let me go to my second favorite station. Oh, I don't like this song. Let me go to my third favorite station. And you're sort of a slave to those buttons. Once you're in there, once you've set that up by and large, people are going to listen to whatever's on those six buttons and that's it with podcasting. That is not the case. You never have to listen to one of these few things. There's something new everywhere because where do you listen to it? Most of the time you listen to it on your phone. Well, your phone also has Spotify and also has Apple music and also has YouTube. And then you've got that podcast button and maybe you've got all these, maybe you got Sirius XM or Stitcher or whatever else you got on your phone. But the point is once you open each app, man, there aren't just six presets. You got just a ton of stuff. So a lot of radio guys, I think get into podcasting and they think, well, I'm going to do my show for four hours today. What are you going to talk about? I don't know. We'll figure it out. And that's fine because people are in their car either way. And they just want something going on in the background as they're taking their kids to school. But a podcast is something that I had to seek out, find time for, go look for, and now I'm going to be emotionally invested in. 
I can't say that's the same for the radio shows. And if that was true and fans really did and listeners really did have that relationship, then they would listen to that radio show on their phone because most radio stations are now streaming online now anyway. So they would listen to the whole four hour radio show, but they don't. I mean, the data tells us that most people listen to the radio for like 20 minutes or something. Yeah. So if that's the case, why are people listening to these hour and two hour? And in my case, sometimes three hour podcasts, because there's an emotional investment in that versus this is one just here to pass the time. This is what I listen to as I drive to work. Not, this is my favorite station. Not, this is my favorite radio show. Not, this is my favorite anything. It's just, this is what I listen to as I take my kids to school or on my way to work versus our podcast, man, you really got to go. No, I'm going to plop down on my couch or while I'm riding the lawnmower today, or when I go for my hike or while I'm at my job, I want to listen to this. Not I have to, I want to, and I have to seek it out. And I think that's the shift you have to have in your mentality from going from radio to podcasting. You know, part of doing this podcast, Andy podcaster for me, like I told you before, is giving back to the community and trying to make a difference and help people that are really starting or just having difficulty or just want to learn more about content creation at the end of the day, that will cheesy cliche. I'd say that's my purpose. What about you, Conrad? And this is the last question, everything that you're building, you're having fun doing, you're loving it. But at the end of the day, when you're thinking about it, what would you like to see happen with everything that you're building? And what would you say your purpose is? Well, I don't really know what the end game is. I do think that the shows have always sort of existed separately. Adfreeshows.com, our super Patreon, if you will, has brought most of them together. I think there probably will be a more formalized way to bring them all together and sell sponsorships as a network more than just, you know, onesie twosie. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know how to answer what my purpose is. I think you know, I know my, I know why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to sell mortgages. You know, mm-hmm. I've always wanted to, I spent uh, millions of dollars advertising my mortgage companies over the years. And I've realized, Hey, I don't have to pay to do that anymore. Now I can have my own stick, if you will, to use a radio term. And I can do that. Now I still do radio, but I don't do it to near the level I did before. You know, whereas before in Huntsville, I was spending, I don't know, 60 grand a month just on radio, just in my home market, not counting Nashville or Chattanooga or any of the markets I dabbled in. But just in Huntsville, I would spend 60 grand in radio just every month. Yeah. And not even bad an eye. And now I probably spend like, I don't know, eight grand. So yeah. it's a fraction of what it was before. And at times during the pandemic, I mean, it was nothing. I mean, for two years, we didn't spend a dollar in radio because I wasn't convinced people were used. They weren't in the car like they used to be. And I just didn't think it was as valuable. But podcasting got bigger and bigger through the pandemic. So that worked. So my purpose is to help serve the families that I help employ and created jobs for and give them opportunities. And, and that's what I'm really probably most proud of. And I know I've created a bunch of content and, and we've got a bunch of listeners and it was a weird thing to say, but a lot of fans, but the thing I take the most pride in is boy, we've created a lot of jobs. We, we've helped a lot of people help take care of their fa- create an opportunity to take care of their families. And when I go do meet and greets and things at our live podcast shows and whatnot, I hear a lot of people say, boy, your show's really helped me get through this tough time here or there. And I guess that's my purpose, man, is to help people, whether it's buy a house, get rid of credit card debt, put food on the table for their family, provide health insurance for their family, or help people who are listening get through a tough time and relive maybe happier, simpler times because I'm a nostalgia dealer. And that is something I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. And I think it's kind of at the end game, like similar to what I just said, right? At the end of the day, it's about helping. And when that organically happens, because you can tell that you're a sincere, we can all be a bit of a wise ass, right? Yourself included. But at the end of the day, you're you're a sincere, personable, relatable guy, man. And I think for me, that's what helps translate into the content you're creating. And it does make it feel good. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, the reality is I'm just like anybody else. I'm just a fan and I'm trying real hard and I'm doing my best. And I think if you're honest about that and you don't put yourself on a pedestal, the people will allow you to stumble over a word here or there. And by the way, when we do, we leave it in. I mean, I'll be in the middle of an ad read and mispronounce something and say, oof, easy for me to say and keep it going because I'm not a real radio salesperson. Like I'm not I'm not a pitch man. I mean, I know I'm pitching a bunch of stuff, but 
I didn't used to be, I used to just be the mortgage guy. And and now through a series of happy accidents, here I am. And so I think when you position yourself like that, honestly, the fans will respond in kind and the listeners will gravitate to it because it's real. And I think that methodology works. Just be honest, tell people the truth, look them in the straight, look them in the eye, give them the straight answer. You know, don't beat around the bush and they'll be back for more. That seems to work. I've had a hell of a time with this conversation. I like to say that rather than interview a lot of the time, you know, but I hope you have too, man. I hope everybody listening, if they haven't checks out your content, it's incredible. And you're a great example and you make great content and you're a great person. So I'm going to give you a second to kind of talk about where they can find the stuff that you're doing. Sure. Yeah. I'm on save with Conrad.com for my mortgage company. If you're looking to refinance, if you're looking to buy, I would recommend buy with Conrad.com. Either way, you're going to be talking to me and my crew here in Huntsville, Alabama, but we're licensed in almost every single state. And if you'd like to check out my podcast, well, that's easy. Uh, Just follow me on Twitter at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad. And I'm on Instagram at Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson. I've got a little link tree there that'll link you to all of my conventions and my Patreons and my different podcasts. And if you're an old school wrestling fan, I've probably got something that's for you. I've got podcasts from the creator of the NWO and Monday Nitro and Bill Goldberg and Eric Bischoff and a creator from all the famous WWF stuff from the rock and stone cold and all the glory days of Hulk Hogan. That's with Bruce Pritchard. we got the voice of wrestling, Jim Ross, maybe the most beloved personality, Tony Schiavone, the recent hall of famers like diamond Dallas page and, and, and Jake, the snake Roberts and Jeff Jarrett and Kurt angle and on and on and on. It's growing all the time. And my latest and greatest is with Mick Foley, who mm-hmm. has just had tremendous success as an author and as a, a stand-up comedian and a one man storytelling show. And now he's bringing that to a podcast and it debuted at number one and boy, we're having a lot of fun again, man. I have a hell of a lot of respect for you and I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, man. Thanks for the time today. And, uh, I hope we help some folks today for sure. Thanks for listening. And thanks for telling a friend. But more importantly, thank you for supporting independent content creators. If you're enjoying the podcast or like the work we're doing in the indie podcaster community, I ask you to tell just one fellow content creator that hasn't heard of this podcast or the work we're doing and share it with them. But more importantly, I hope you continue with me on this journey as the indie podcaster. Keep being you. Keep being great. And the question is, do I stay here? Will you be back? Are you going to come back? Will you be back? Are you coming back?